there are many questions you are faced with every day. We are all searching for answers that will make a real difference in our lives. It's hard to imagine that these answers might be right in front of us. Get ready to discover answers in the Bible with Bayless Conley. Hello, I'm Bayless Conley and uh, we've got a great word for you today. Have you ever wondered what Jesus meant when he said, I am the door? I mean, is that just some cryptic, you know, statement that we're not meant to understand or is it actually applicable to our lives? Well, our son Harrison brought a brilliant message along these lines, telling us what Jesus meant by saying, I am the door and I think you're going to be richly blessed by it. John 10 and verse number 7 says this, Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and he'll go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I want to just back up to verse 9 and read that once more. That's going to be our key text. I want us to anchor up here this morning. Verse number 9, Jesus said, I am the door. If you've got a pen, maybe you want to circle or underline or highlight those four words. Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and he'll go in and out and he will find pasture. Throughout the gospel, as you read, Jesus refers to himself at one point as bread. He said, I'm the bread of life. In another place, he refers to himself as water. He said, all you who thirst, come to me and drink. Everyday objects, things that everybody understands. And then here in our text, he calls himself the door. An object, a picture that even a child can use and understand. And the humility and the humanity of our Savior is, is staggering. And this morning, I want to talk to you about Jesus, the door. If you're looking for a title this morning, that's my subject. Jesus, the door. And I've got my awesome prop here, my my door that we'll get to in just a moment. What I want to do, I want to highlight just a couple of things from the text that we've read. So let's jump right back into the text. I want to just bring for your observation three, three different things. Number one, I want to talk about the door itself. Uh, secondly, I want to talk about the users of the door, those that find entrance. And then lastly, I want to talk about the results of entering through the door. And we're going to, like I said, anchor up here in verse number nine. That's going to be our key point of reference. So you might want to just keep your Bible open. But let's start with talking about the door itself. And two things I'd like to draw your attention to. I want you to understand that the door, it's necessary. And then secondly, that the door, it's singular. That there's only one door. Hear me. In order to access salvation, in order to partake in the mercy of God, it is of the greatest necessity that there be an entrance, that there be a door. Jesus said, I'm that door. He said, I am the door. Please notice, Jesus is our door, and he's the only door. He didn't say, I'm one among many doors. He said, I am the door. There is only one door into the kingdom of God, singular, only one door. Jesus said, I am that door. Years ago, I was preaching in, in Germany. I was there with Pastor Bayless. We were doing a series of meetings, and it sort of all culminated in this big arena in East Berlin, and we're going to do one final meeting, and they took us in this side door, and then took us down below the auditorium through this kind of labyrinth of a hallway, and into this green room where we were able to put down our stuff, and sort of relax, have a cup of tea before the meeting started, and meeting's about to start, so we head out of there, and we head up in the auditorium, we're standing on the front row, and the musicians are beginning to take their place, meeting's about to begin, the countdown timer's counting down 10, 9, 8, getting down to zero, and I, I begin to realize, oh shoot, I left my cell phone backstage in that green room. I want to get it. I want to capture the moments here and take some pictures. And so I excuse myself, and I, I run back downstage, and, and I run underneath the auditorium, and I find that green room. I let myself in, open the door. Door shuts behind me. I go, and I, I get my bag, and I shuffle through, and I find my cell phone, and I go to leave to get back out into the auditorium. But the door had shut, and it had locked behind me. Now, I don't know if every door in Germany locks from the outside, but in the United States, like, doors lock on the inside, right? <laughs> 
And for 10 minutes, I'm banging on this door. And I can hear the music starting and playing above me. It's like, oops, oops, and I'm banging to the beat, oops, oops, trying to get out. I'm yelling at the top of, my, top of my lungs, but nobody can hear me, right? Like I'm trying to, to call people and text people from my phone, but there's no cell reception because I'm underneath this arena. And, and it finally got to the place after about 10, 15 minutes where I, I was just going to give up. I was like, all right, I guess I'm missing the meeting tonight. And, and I sat down in this chair, and I'm beginning to catch my breath. And as I catch my breath, I look up. And I noticed that the ceiling's made out of like T-bar and that there's this big air conditioning duct. <laughs> now, I've watched a lot of James Bond movies over the years. And, and I said, well, you know, it's kind of a big air duct, but I don't know, what if I could fit into that? And I pulled the table over and I began to stack up chairs and I got up there and I removed part of the T-bar and then I pulled the grate off the air conditioning duct and I, I looked through it and I thought, yeah, it's going to be a tight squeeze, but I think I can make it. And at the end of the duct, about 10 feet, I could see light at the, the end of the tunnel. So I thought to myself, well, YOLO, right? Like you only have once. I <laughs> popped myself into this thing and I start army crawling, literally on my hands and knees, army crawling through this thing. I get to the end where the light is and I pop the grate off and I poke my head over. I look down. Sure enough, it's going to let me down on the other side of the wall of this green room. So I, I pop through and I, I dust myself off and I run back up into the auditorium and I'm sitting there on the front row next to Pastor B and he, he looks at me and goes, where have you been? I said, no, 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 you don't understand. The question is not where have you been. The question is who have you been? I said, I've been 007. You don't even know. <laughs> but the point is this, that unlike a German green room, uh, there is no secret or alternative way into the kingdom of God. You're not sneaking in through some air conditioning duct, no. <laughs> there is only one entrance through the door, which is Christ. Now, the world, society, religion will tell us a completely different story. Oftentimes, they'll say something completely contrary. They'll tell us, hey, look, th 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 there's... Lots of ways. Find your own way. There's no absolute truth. Like what works for you doesn't have to work for me. What works for me doesn't have to work for you. There's all kind of doors. Like all roads, they, they lead to happiness. All roads, they, they lead to God. And hey, you know, just take the different pieces of spirituality from, from this ideology and from this philosophy and whatever floats your boat and create your own truth. And if you don't like any of that, then make your own way and live your own life. Friend, listen to me. Don't be deceived by the wisdom of the age. There is only one door. There's only one way. There's only one truth. There's only one life, and his name is Jesus. John 14, 6, Jesus said this, I am the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. I'm the door. You get to the Father through me. You can search all the earth, and you can read all the books and all the words of the philosophers. You can chant. You can observe religious ritual. You can participate in ceremony. But friend, you will find no other door. You will not find a door through self-righteousness. You will not find a door through self-sufficiency. You will not find a door through self-awareness or self-discipline. No, there is only one door. There is only one name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. That name, that door is Jesus. And on one side of the door is his humanity. On the other side of the door is his divinity. Friend, he is the incarnate God that came and died for our sins, who was raised back to life by the Spirit of God, who has ascended and sits at the right hand of the Father, who speaks on our behalf as our advocate. This is Jesus who is coming back again for his people. And it is him and him alone that is our door. He said, I am the door. I'm the door, and all who enter by me will be saved. So we've talked about the door. Let, let's, let's talk about the users of this door for a moment. As we've already established, the purpose of a door is to give entrance, to give access to the house. Yet there are some who are content to just approach the door, stand at the door, gaze at the door, and maybe even admire the door. They say, wow, what a... What a beautiful door that is. Some even sit at the porch. But yet they never enter in. There are some that sit in these services every single week. There are some that watch online, that listen to the music, that sing along with some of the songs, that hear the message being preached. Some people that when service concludes will comment to their friends and leave a comment on social media about how great of a time they had, yet they've never trusted in or submitted 
to the Jesus who was preached. They looked at the door. They admired the door. But they never entered through the door. And listen, if that's you, if you're sitting in service today and you're sort of just checking things out, like, you are welcome here. We love it. Keep coming. Keep singing. Keep listening. Keep checking things out. But our prayer for you is that you would fall in love with Jesus and that you'd give your life to him, that you would enter through the door. There are also those that perhaps have gone one step further. They don't just stand at the door. They don't just admire the door. They, they've even occasionally knocked at the door. There are those that occasionally throw up a prayer before God, but they're convinced that heaven doesn't listen because God didn't respond in the way that they wanted him to respond or in the manner in which they expected him to respond. And hear me, it's good to knock at this door, but it's not enough to just knock. The scripture doesn't say anyone that knocks, they'll be saved. No, it says if anyone enters, they'll be saved. Now, knocking is a great place to start. Matthew 7, 7, we have the promise, seek and you'll find knock and the door will be open to you. It's wise to knock, but don't stop there. You must enter through the door. There's another group that I've, I've noticed, and we don't need to spend long here, but this group I, I like to call the guardians of the door. Um, they usually stand with their picket signs, <laughs> with their sour attitudes and their angry faces, and they pace back and forth like sentinels guarding the door. I've met people in my 33 years here on the planet that are downright bulldogs when it comes to defending the gospel, but yet they've never experienced or entered into that gospel themselves. There are a lot of people that are part of this group. Their favorite verse is 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. And they quote it to people. They're going to throw it up on the screen. They stand there with their picket signs, and they read verses like this. Do you not know that the unrighteous, they will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites. Verse number 10, they say, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners. None of them will inherit the kingdom of God. And they stand there with their sign, hashtag, nope, you're not getting in. You, nope, you, nope, you, nope, 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 nope. No, and they defend the gospel they've never experienced themselves. And last time I checked, it was God's job to be God, not our job to be God. Um, and sometimes I just wish that the guardians would read the very next verse. Look at verse 11. And such were some of you. Oops. We forget so quickly, don't we? But we were washed but we were sanctified, but we were justified by the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. <laughs> Hear me. I don't want to religiously guard some door that I've never entered through myself. Paul told Timothy, his young protege, his young preacher, 1 Timothy 4 and 16, he said, Timothy, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in so doing, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Hear me, not everyone that talks about heaven will necessarily end up in heaven. We have to enter through the door. So the question becomes, who, who can enter this door? Verse number nine says, if anyone enters, if anyone enters by me, they will be saved. If anyone, if Anyone, note the text does not say entrance is only reserved for important people, for presidents, kings, queens, and dignitaries. It doesn't say that entrance is granted to celebrities, CEOs, or only people of influence. It doesn't say that you have to be wealthy or intelligent or of a particular ethnicity, regardless of what some Christians will tell you. The text does not say that entrance is only for those that have their lives in perfect working order, that have their ducks all in a row, who have no baggage, who have no past, who have no current issues, who have no questions, who have no regret, regrets, or are in perfect standing with the law. No, the text doesn't say that. What does it say? If anyone, if anyone, if anyone enters by me, anyone, I guess that means the tax collector, it means the prostitute, it means the hitman, it means the preacher, the athlete, the students, the artist, the picket sign holder, it might even mean the Republican, it might even mean the Democrat, it might mean the man, the woman, the boy, the girl, red, yellow, black, white, they're all precious in his sight. Friend, anybody! That's the premise of the gospel. This is the heart and the theme of our God. Anybody, the gospel, it's strictly inclusive, it's not exclusive. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, 
Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Who's whosoever? Anybody! Friend, going through the door is the very image and definition of faith. We pass from one side of Christ to the other. You see, on this side of the door, I, I pass from who I am in my self-righteousness. And as I pass through the door, that is Christ. Something supernatural happens on the inside of me. My self-righteousness stays on that side. But now, on this side, I become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit pours out the love of the Father into my heart. I become a new creation in Christ. The old is gone. I am brand new. Something supernatural happens when I walk through that door. But hear me, if you're going to walk through the door, there's a few things you have to leave behind. A few things you can't take with you. I've met lots of people who've spent all their life amassing and packing up all of their good works, and they think that this is going to get them through the door. And they, uh, they struggle, and they strive, and they think, well, I did this, and I did that. Surely God will accept me, and they go to walk through the door, but they don't fit. And they try again, and they, they don't fit. They think, man, maybe I need a running start. And they, they go, and they still don't fit. Friend, if you're going to enter through the door, you must lay aside your good works. The prophet tells us in Isaiah that even on our best day, our good works are like filthy rags before God. It's not our good works that get us to the door. It's the good work, the finished work of Jesus. It gets us to the door. There, there, there's other things that we need to leave aside. Sometimes people, they miss the door entirely because their head's held too high in pride. Self-sufficiency, self-righteousness. And they miss the door completely. Friend, no, it's not our self-righteousness. It's not our pride. It's not our ability to pull ourselves up by our bootstrap. It's Jesus and Him alone. But the question becomes, well, then how, how do I enter this door? Let me show you. On bended knee. In submission. In humility. We come to the door and we say, God, I've got nothing to offer, but I've got everything to receive. And I'm coming to you not based on my merit, not based on my achievement, not based on my accolade. I'm coming to you based on your son, Jesus. And I'm here to tell you that when you come to him like that, you find that that door is unlocked. And as you make your way through, you realize that you are accepted, not because of your doing, you're approved, not because you pulled yourself up by your bootstrap. You're not forgiven based on your penance or what you can do. You are forgiven, you're approved, and you're accepted because Jesus is accepted. Jesus is approved. And Jesus took our place. We enter through him. And then finally... As the band comes and join me, the keyboard player is going to make me sound really spiritual as I talk about this third point. <laughs> third observation. Let's talk about the results. The results of entering through the door. First result is salvation. I love our text. It says, if anyone enters by me, they will be saved. Salvation. This is what every human heart longs for. This is what every soul desires. Innately, we know that something's wrong something's off. When we pass through the door, we find salvation. Salvation from the guilt of sin. Salvation from the power of sin. Salvation from the ultimate punishment of sin, which is death. We're saved from being who we were in the past. When we enter through the door, the Bible calls it being born again. We change on the inside. We become a new creation in Christ Jesus where the old is gone everything becomes new. So from God's vantage point, from God's eyes, we're new. We are born again. And when God looks at us, he doesn't see mistakes. He doesn't see mess ups. He doesn't see fall. He sees righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him, in Christ. As we pass through the door, I'm not righteous here. As I pass through the door, I become righteous. God looks at me. He sees me through the filter of his son, Jesus. We're saved from being who we were in the past. We have a new start, a new beginning. We're new creations in Christ Jesus. You go, hey, I got all kind of issues. Back. Yeah, so do I. But God is at work in us. And when we pass through that door, the Bible says the Holy Spirit pours out his love into our hearts. The Bible says that it's God's good pleasure to be at work in us, to will and to do of his purposes and his plans. 
He goes to work in us, changing us, shaping us, molding us from the inside out into the image and into the likeness of Jesus. We find salvation when we enter through the door. The second thing that we find as we enter through the door, the second result is freedom. Jesus said, if anyone enters by me, they'll be saved and they'll go in and out. Hear me, we, we don't come to Jesus to be locked into a prison. No, we shall go in and out. We have freedom in Jesus, who the sun sets free is free indeed. We're saved into this freedom. We have freedom to be able to go to bed at night and not be afraid of death. Freedom to go into our worlds and our families, our neighborhoods, our, our workplaces, our schools, our spheres of influence, and, and know that no matter the situation, no matter the trouble, no matter the circumstance that arises, the grace of God is there and it covers us and it, it gives us wisdom and it gives us a strength not just to survive the situation but to thrive in the midst of it, to have a joy that's unshakable, to have a confidence that our God is for us, that he's with us, where we know beyond any shadow of a doubt that no weapon or plan of the enemy will sustain itself against us. It will not prosper against us because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. We find freedom in Christ Jesus. We also find freedom to go to God in prayer knowing that he hears us, knowing that his word is true, knowing that he will move heaven and earth to perform his word, that his word is not void. It holds power to change and transform us. And as we grab hold of the promises of God and we begin to pray them before them, we know that when we ask in faith, he accomplishes his word. We have freedom in Christ Jesus, our door. And then lastly, the last result is nourishment. Jesus said, if anyone enters by me, they'll be saved, they'll go in and out, and they'll find pasture. Now, pasture is sort of a, an odd term that we don't use regularly in our Western world, but first century Jewish world, the Eastern world, um, it's a term that they used and they all would have understood. Often God refers to us in the scripture as a sheep, and he's the shepherd. Jesus, even in John 10, refers to himself. He said, I'm the good shepherd. We're his sheep. And he leads us into pasture. Pasture is where the shepherd would lead the sheep and they could find rest and restoration, food and drink. They would be safe in that place. And we have the promise that as we enter through the door of Jesus, we find nourishment. We'll find pasture that whatever our hearts need to live upon, whatever our hearts need to fill them, to sustain them, to grow them, to comfort them, and to perfect them, we find it in Jesus. He's our all in all song we used to sing. I love it. It says, Jesus is the cup that never runs dry. You see, when we come to Jesus, our door, we find life. John 10 and 10, he said, I've come that she might have life and that she might have it more abundantly. But that life is the result of entering through the door. Let me ask you this morning. Have you passed from death to life? Have you been taken from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light? Have you passed through the door, Jesus? Have you put your trust in him? Have you come to the conclusion that you have nothing to offer God and you have everything to receive? Have you come to this place of revelation by the power of the Holy Spirit where you realize, I need a savior. That the sin in my life, it cuts me off and it separates me from the life of God. You see, as I've been preaching this morning, the Holy Spirit's been at work in your heart. He's been doing two things. He's been convicting your heart and he's been convincing your heart convicting your heart of sin. That's not something I can do. As a matter of fact, it's not something I'm interested in doing. I got my own issues. I'm figuring out my own salvation with much fear and trembling. I'm not interested in convicting you of sin. That's something the Holy Spirit has to do. He has to convict your heart. He has to bring it via revelation that sin exists in your life and that sin separates us from God. That there's a chasm that exists between us and God, but in the same breath, he goes to work convincing our hearts that although the sin is great, there's an even greater savior. There's a bridge, there's a door. His name is Jesus. And if you put your trust in him, sin is forgiven. God says he removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. Gosh, I love this so much. If you're new to the church, you've probably never heard this before, but you know why God says he removes the sin is, as far as the east is from the west? Because east and west, they, they, they never touch. Like imagine a globe in your hand, the, 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 the sphere of the earth. And imagine you start at the North Pole and you're gonna start heading south. So I'm, I'm going south, I'm going south, I'm going south, I'm going south. You hit the South Pole, all of a sudden what? Now you're going north, you're going north, you're going north, hit the North Pole, you're going south, going south. See, north and south, they touch. But imagine you're starting in Los Angeles and you're gonna fly toward New York. I'm going east, 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 I'm going east. I'm 
going east. I'm still going east, going east, going east, going east. East and west, they never touch. And as far as the east is from the west, that's how far God removes our sin. How does he do it? Through the door. Through Jesus. Jesus became our sin. He was punished as a result of becoming our sin. So that we could become righteous before God. So that we could slip into his righteousness. Not our righteousness based on our good works, our merit. No, based upon Jesus and his finished work on the cross this morning. Have you put your trust in Jesus? Have you entered through the door? Maybe you've come to the door. Maybe you've stood there. You've admired the door. You thought, wow, this Jesus story, I love it. What a, what a beautiful Jesus he is. But you never passed through. Maybe you've knocked at the door. Don't stop knocking. But friend, that's not enough. You've got to enter through. You've got to enter through. Maybe you've guarded the door. But you've never experienced or entered into the gospel message, the saving grace of Jesus yourself. Please, this morning, enter through the door. He loves you. He's not mad at you. The amazing thing about the gospel is that God loves us just the way we are. Isn't that crazy? With all of our stories, with all of our past, with all of our hang-ups, God loves us as we are. But the amazing thing about his love is the moment that we pass through the door, his love goes to work in our life. He loves us as we are, but his love never leaves us as we are. It's so supernatural. It's so magnanimous. It literally changes us from the inside out. Thank you for joining us for the message today. I pray that it did something substantial in your life. You know, I'd like to encourage you to subscribe to one of our YouTube channels. We have them in multiple languages and just about any time you want, you can get some of the word, feed on it, uh, nourish yourself spiritually. So again, subscribe to one of our YouTube channels, a lot of different languages, and uh, find a richer blessing in your life. And we will see you next time. Did you know that the Bible is full of promises? Promises from God for you, to give you hope. God means just what he says. He is faithful to his word. Bayless Conley's inspirational calendar for the new year, A Promise is a Promise, can be yours when you contact us today. Find a new Bible verse each month to remind you that God has given us his promises because he wants to fulfill them in our lives. This calendar will help you discover who God is and learn how to make his promises a reality in your life. Call or order online now. We hope you enjoyed today's message. Order the full version of this teaching on CD, DVD, or MP3 by using the contact details on screen now. Our prayer for you is that you'll continually grow in the wisdom, faith, and power that comes when we hear and apply God's word in our daily lives.